Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, for, for coming out to the Institute for Law and Economics, Law and Entrepreneurship Lecture. Um, this series creates opportunities for the Penn Law community to learn from individuals who have pursued noteworthy careers as corporate executives, institutional investors, practicing lawyers, and public servants. Each lecturer has embodied entrepreneurial accomplishment in a unique and different way. Uh, with today's lecturer, Jeremy Nowak, we continue and deepen this tradition. Uh, Mr. Nowak, as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Reinvestment Fund, is a nationally recognized leader in urban development and neighborhood regeneration. Across a quarter century, his entrepreneurship has made a difference for the better for thousands of people. Uh, back in 1985, uh, Mr. Nowak was a community organizer in North Philadelphia. Uh, he launched the Reinvestment Fund that year with the objective of bringing capital and civic organization and organizers together in pursuit of opportunity and economic growth for economically challenged families and communities. During that first year, the fund pulled together $250,000. Five years later, the fund had $1.8 million of assets under management. Uh, by 2006, the figure was $388 million. Assets under management went on to grow to $679 million in 2010. Last year, the fund closed on 90 new transactions and invested $85.7 million. The fund connects socially motivated capital with economically viable housing, development, and commercial projects in inner city neighborhoods, working across the entire mid-Atlantic region. It has developed a large network of socially motivated investors and financed more than 2,500 projects. These include housing, community arts centers, schools, commercial real estate, and sustainable energy endeavors. The Reinvestment Fund is also a repository of knowledge and expertise about cities and as such plays an expanding public policy role. Um, in addition to his work with the Reinvestment Fund, Mr. Nowak is Vice Chair of the Board of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank. He chairs the Board of Mastery Charter School Foundation, which supports Mastery Charter Schools, a network of inner city middle and high schools and Alex's Lemonade Stand, a charity that has raised millions of dollars for pediatric cancer research. Uh, he's been a fellow at the Aspen Institute and is a member of the Kennedy School's executive session on cities and social enterprise. He holds a doctorate in cultural anthropology from the New School for Social Research. Last but not least, in 1995, Mr. Nowak was the recipient of the Philadelphia Award, uh, the city's highest civic honor. We're delighted Thank you. Nowak, that you're here to speak to us about your career and the trajectory of the fund. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Institute for uh, Law and Economics and uh, Michael Wachter and Jill Fish and Bill Bratton, uh, directors, and also uh, actually Dean Fitz and Ed Rock, I think it was speaking of one of their classes was probably the genesis of this uh, uh, some time ago. Um, so it is great to be here at one of the great law schools in the, uh, in the country and uh, to chat a little bit about what I do. Um, I don't have a watch on me, so when I get to that point where I'm supposed to get a hook and take, take uh, questions, somebody, you know, go like that or, you know, or yawn or something. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to... Um, talk a little bit. I'm going to use uh, some of the work of the reinvestment fund and some of the things I think about to just engage in a conversation about the kinds of issues that I think about and the kinds of issues that, um, that I'm involved with. Am I hitting this the right way? Uh, that's the wrong way. That's the right way. So because I'm in a law school, I figured I would start with a lawyer, uh, with a jurist. And um, one of my favorite quotes in the world is from uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said he would not give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but would give his life, I'm not sure I'd give my life for it, but would give his life for simplicity on the other side of complexity. 
which uh, in my view is a really important way to think about things, particularly because we're in a world of uh, simplicity on this side of complexity. Uh, you, put, you put the TV on every day. And um, so I want to talk about um, what I do, and then I want to sort of just suggest some issues that I think would get us closer to simplicity on the other side of complexity. Uh, I'll do that by talking a little bit about what we do, a little bit about the problems of cities like Philadelphia um, and uh, other cities, Baltimore, cities, older cities like that, and then some reflections on a set of issues, and then I'll return uh, to that theme. So uh, as I said, as was said, uh, uh, TRF's been around for a while. It's done about, it's got about $700 million now it manages. It's actually done about a billion dollars of investments, which uh, represents about three and a half billion dollars worth of uh, deals, real estate deals, small businesses, a variety of interesting things. Uh, and besides lending and investing, it's got uh, a pretty large uh, policy, a public policy role that it plays. It's got a, a geographic information systems database, which actually Penn's library subscribes to. So you can just go on it and use it for free. It's terrific. It's, it's I describe it as um, um, using MapQuest, except it doesn't tell you where the Pizza Huts are, but it tells you that there's 10,000, it gives you 10, access to about 10,000 database, 10,000 data uh, points. And then we do real estate development directly in a couple different states, and uh, then we also uh, do uh, analysis for uh, a variety of policy issues. And in fact, my colleague, Ira Goldstein, who runs that, is here. And so if I speak about things and I get to a point where I don't know what I'm talking about, I'll just, I'll just uh, re refer it over to Ira. Um, and just outcomes, just to give you a sense, we've financed now about, to give you a sense of our, you know, the world I live in is sort of the world of deals, of projects, and we've financed about uh, close to 20,000 uh, housing units. Uh, we're a big lender, and I'm going to talk somewhat about schools. We're a big lender to real estate for uh, charter schools, and I've played a big role for some of the best schools, uh, I think, in the, in, the, uh, in the inner city, about 30,000 seats. Um, we've done about eight and a half million square feet of commercial real estate, including a significant uh, a portfolio of inner city uh, and some rural uh, supermarkets, um, and uh, done a, a pretty, pretty good amount of work in uh, renewable energy, and then have played some role in the creation of close to 50,000 jobs now over that period of time. So what's the problem? How do I think about um, the problem when I think about these issues, um, and I think about the, the city. Um, there's a lot of ways, obviously, to think about cities and think about older cities, particularly like Philadelphia. I mean, if you go to, you know, think about Philadelphia, it's lost a half million people in about 50 years. Um, uh, it's got a significant amount of, uh, of real estate that is uh, obsolete, problematic. You just, you know, wander through the, wander through the uh, streets of Philadelphia and you can see that. And what's really clear about places like Philadelphia is that these are places that had, for a variety of reasons, up through the first half of the 20th century, what I would think of as kind of a monopoly status. That is, you had to be here for if you were involved in certain kinds of industries. And it had, and, and to some extent, and one of the interesting problems of places like Philadelphia is it created a political culture around that monopoly status. So, you know, you had to be in Philadelphia if you were a manufacturer, you did other kinds of things, banking, stuff like that. And then the world changed. And the second half of the 21st cent second half of the 20th century is really about the decomposition of that monopoly status to some extent. Now that's a really overly simplistic way of talking about it, but it's but it's it's also true to a large extent. And as that status evaporated, some places have been able to reinvent themselves. Some cities have actually done a great job uh, of that. You know, I mean, you, we think about Detroit, who lost all of a uh, certain kind of manufacturing. But, you know, think about New York City, who lost as much te many textile jobs as many cities lost auto worker jobs. And in fact, New York City uh, uh, manufactured itself, uh, reinvented itself in lots of interesting uh, kinds of ways. But so some cities have been able to reinvent themselves. Some cities have not been able to reinvent themselves. It's not clear what will happen to those places. They are, they are much smaller, uh, much, much less important to the regional economy than they were at some other uh, time. And, um, and it's not, it's, it's, they've got uh, not only outmoded governance, and outmo and, but they have outmoded infrastructure. And this whole question of where these places are going to go, whether Cleveland can make it, what it means for Cleveland to make it. What do you do with Detroit? Has anybody been to Detroit lately? I mean, it's just lost this extraordinary amount of people. I mean, you just drive through it. It has got rural densities, right? I mean, literally rural densities for whole parts of it, right? St. Louis, you see the, the, the numbers that are coming out. Chicago's 
population is back down to where it was in 1920, right? Cities like Philadelphia are really fascinating because they're really kind of two places, right? So in, in, for the one hand, on the one hand, it's got some real vibrancy around here, downtown, some other selected neighborhoods, and then whole parts of it are not vibrant at all and are quite uh, problematic. And so when you think about it, when everybody thinks about cities and they think about what to do, they say, well, you know, it's how, how are you going to make it? Where are, you, where are your competitive advantages? How will places make it? And they say, you know, well, it's going to be linked to maybe the quality of its human capital. Maybe we'll have people who've, who've got the, uh, the, the requisite skills. Uh, maybe it's about, to, it's about repurposing old assets, you know, physical assets, institutional assets, whatever. Uh, maybe it's about regional growth dynamics, biomedical, whatever the things are, you know, high-end manufacturing, uh, professional services. But for the business that I'm in, for the work that I do, the problem, the way I define the problem is the problem we have is how, on the one hand, you link the problem of urban and regional competitiveness, which is a huge issue for America right now, right? This is a bad decade when it comes to jobs, right? America almost in this decade didn't create a net new job. It churned a lot, but the data is really extraordinary. And I know there are a few economists in the room, so I hope I don't get it wrong. But you know, my reading of the data is that since we kept good employment data in the late 30s, there hasn't been a decade that quite is like that, right? So there's a sort of a broad question, given globalization, given shifts in power, given shifts in technology and communications. It's a broad question that America and many other places have. Where they, how do they grow? Where, how do they absorb labor? And then for places like Philadelphia, for places like Baltimore where we work, let alone little cities like Chester and Camden, or if you go to Cleveland, you know, the question is not simply what, what is possible in terms of these places growing, but if these places can grow, how do you do it in such a way that creates value for places that are, seem to have limited value? are places with uh, high degrees of distress or places where high populations of low moderate income people with limited, limited capacity live. Like, so how do you do it? How do you have growth on the one hand and how do you have equity on the other hand? And, and if, you know, if you were a mayor of Philadelphia, you would say, if you were, um, you probably would say that your biggest problem is how do you pursue growth and equity at the same time? How do you deal with sort of the various constituencies that want that, and how do you do it within the context of a really complicated global economy? You know, I don't know how many of you are from here, but if 20 or 30 years ago a mayor of Philadelphia, and occasionally they would ask, if a mayor of Philadelphia said, you know, what, what am I up against? I would have said, well, let's go to a, get on a helicopter and let's fly over the King of Prussia Mall in suburban Philadelphia, and here's what you're up against. They have more retail jobs than all of downtown Philadelphia. But if you ask me now, I'd say, let's go to the Pearl River Valley in China. You want to see a port? I'll show you a port. It's not the Delaware River, right? I'd say you'd get it. And, and to some extent, part of the American problem is not only the sort of the local issues of politics, but how they're related, obviously, to these sort of broader, very difficult issues. And a lot of this can't be solved at the local level. And yet, people politically are strapped with the problem at the local level, right? Right, so you, you know this is the this sort of logical. I know you know this. This becomes a big issue. So localities are strapped with, and the question is, well, what can you do? What's what's possible? It's just from the local perspective. So you know, maybe if I had a you know you know in, in a macro perspective, you know, there's all these other kinds of issues related to economic growth and you know infrastructure investment and you know R and D and job training programs and macroeconomics macroeconomic issues related to monetary policy and trade policy and the like. So, but if you're a mayor of a distressed city, if you're somebody like me who's trying to rebuild build value in this place, you don't really get to say very much about any of those things, right? You don't get to say very much about national policy as it relates to the earned income tax credit or as it relates to the kinds of redistributive things that you can best pursue at a higher level of government. They're actually very difficult to pursue at a lower level of government where people have choices and firms have choices and they can always move out. Does this make sense? Make, so so the, the problem in my world, the way I think about the problem in my world is, the, is this issue of what can you do locally given a set of circumstances, given a set of growth dynamics, and given the fact that you've got a set of limited tools. So I'll just, I want to talk a little bit about that. So the first thing is, is that my first lesson when I started this work early on 
is that governance really counts. High quality governance really counts. Now this seems like a sort of a no-brainer, right? Um, although I would say that some people don't get this completely. So, but, but high quality governance, and what I mean by high quality governance is high quality public goods that are reasonably priced, that are competitively and reasonably priced. And without those goods, with the, in the absence of those goods, it is very difficult over the long term to sustain economic growth, right? You can do it in the short term, right? And anybody that is here, maybe somebody's from another country here, I've done work around the developing world, you know, anybody that's spent time in the developing world knows the meaning of not having predictable, transparent, relevant public goods at a baseline that allows you over the long term to pursue economic ends. It's, a, it's really, it's very, very important. Um, and for places like, you know, Philadelphia or Baltimore or any of these places that I work in, you know, that can mean lots of things. It can mean public safety. It can mean uh, schools. I'll talk a little bit about schools. It can mean infrastructure investment, how public spaces are, how people, you know, take care of basic services. It can mean transportation, right? I mean, I, I'm, this is the time where I always then make fun of SEPTA when I'm talking about this, right? I would say I go to, I go to uh, last year I was in... Um, Asia, I was in um, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, and then in uh, South Korea, and I'm, my, my greatest memory of South Korea, it's a, Seoul is a terrific city if you've been there, and it is to go in and go into the metro and have this terrific little machine there that you, uh, gives you a choice of six languages, and you hit, I hit English, and they ask me where I wanna go, and I press a button, and they give me my options and what the price is, and I put my Visa card in there, and I get the sm and a smart card comes out, and I can easily figure out where the hell to go. And then I came back here, and I got in a place where there were two guys in a token booth, would only sell me two tokens, but not exact change. Now, I realize it's sort of a silly counterposition, but in fact, it's really meaningful, because people with choices will choose quality and efficiency if they have choices. And at the end of the day, political culture that is based only on people and only on firms and only on institutions with limited choice is problematic. Right? This is sort of a, we kind of know this in our gut. Um, you know, anybody remember the great uh, economic uh, development uh, economist uh, Albert Hirschman? One of the great, one of the, remember, remember the great little book he wrote, Exit, was it Exit, for, Loyalty, Exit, Exit Voice and Loyalty, right? I mean, you know, sort of the, I mean, just think about it, right? It's just, he sort of lays it out there, uh, probably wrote it in the late 1960s or something, but it's a really sort of terrific monograph to go back and, and think about. So high quality governance really counts, and uh, you can measure the meaning of that. And here, uh, the first uh, little piece, this is sort of in the midst of some, uh, from some research that we've done where we, you know, took a bunch of housing units all over the city and we said, uh, let's measure by the block group things like crime. Let's look at what the school, school test scores look like. And what's, let's look at what we called um, structural, uh, structural decline, which were things like vacancies and, and, you know, other kinds of issues. And let's try to measure that and see the effect of these things based on the scale that we built. We did this factor analysis and based on the scale that we built. And it turned out that uh, if you moved up, that, that the square footage would go down on the uh, structural decline score about a buck fifty for every point. And it would go down if the, on the crime about a buck. And then if your test scores went up, your same exact house, same exact square footage, same exact age, uh, holding for income, the, the uh, test scores, if your test scores went up, you went up by about 50 cents per square foot, right? So just think about what the meaning of that is. The meaning of that is if you pursue the basics and you do the basics really well, you actually help create wealth. Sort of a remarkable idea, right? And, and the reason it's remarkable is if you think about the extraordinary amount of money that, for example, not enough in some instances, and it's getting beat up in Congress as we speak right now, but if you think of the amount of money that we will use for, say, subsidy for housing development in inner city places, a question, a logical question might be, do you want to subsidize the, the cost of those things to, be, to make up for the, you know, the, the limited value? Or in fact, you want to pursue a whole bunch of other 
um, strategies and the value will go up without you having to put in the subsidy, right? Which is the best way to do it? And I'm not saying one way or the other. I mean, I want a, a, a uh, I'm a, you know, a kind of a, a card-carrying Democrat. But I remember during the, during the Bush administration, uh, somebody from, um, from domestic policy in the Bush White House came to ask me about the Community Development Block Grant, which goes to places, and I, and I said to them, well, if you wanted to really be radical, what you would do is not give any Community Development Block Grant money to any city that didn't have reasonable school reform and public safety strategies. Because real estate doesn't work without that. And these are the Bush people. And they said, that's too much. That's too conservative for us. That's too, too radical for us. Whatever the hell they said, right? Just that's, that's, that's more than we can do. We can't, we can't go that far. What I was trying to say is sort of incent the behavior that what you wanna, of what you want to achieve. And if you think about what Obama did recently with Race to the Top, which I think is probably the best domestic policy that he pursued, it really has some of those uh, elements in it in his education reform. <clears throat> so one thing is we work in places and we do everything we can to get high quality basics and we believe in public policy that incents high quality basics and we don't think it is easy for poor people in low income places and low value places to move unless those basics are delivered. And I would say this in the US and I'd say it anywhere uh, else in the world. I think we're at a point now, and I'll talk a little bit about schools, where maybe, um, maybe the greatest transformation imaginable is happening with urban schools. And I think it's happening piece by piece, and I think it's happening um, some places quietly, and some places, you know, when Michelle Ree gets in trouble, it's happening with a little bit more noise, a little bit more bang. But there's, a, there's this extraordinary movement going on out there to try to create great schools in the midst of the most difficult, in the midst of the most difficult environment. And I've played some role creating them, and I've also done financing, real estate financing, for about 70 of them in places like Washington, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. And, and basic to this whole effort is the idea that great inner city schools don't have to wait until poverty is solved. I mean, and that's a kind of a sort of classic argument. The school's a mess because the kid's background's a mess, and it's the families, and there's truth to that. I mean, you can go back to the Coleman study in the 60s, and it was the families, absolutely. But there's been a whole new generation of people who have started to run schools, a variety of different kinds of schools, and they've said that you can create great schools, and you can bridge the achievement gap, and you don't have to wait to eradicate poverty, but if you create great schools, the great schools themselves will help eradicate poverty. And this, I think, is a really, really important issue. And if I talk to the people that run great schools and spend time in them and I ask them what the key factor is, they would not say curriculum. Nothing about fancy curriculum. They would say the key factor is can you manage the school? Do you manage it? It's high quality management. It's, it's not, not to privatize, not in the, you know, sort of the language of run it like a business. And, and you know, very often people sort of confuse the idea that in the public sphere and the social sphere, what, you, what a lot of people are asking for is it for it to be run like a business. In fact, what people want to do is to run it with a high level of discipline and a high level of accountability. And people have done that in some of the most difficult places in Philadelphia and in New York and many other places, and it's begun to break the mold of what is possible. We have too many examples right now of schools that are successful to, achieve, to assume that the achievement gap can't be closed. If people ask me what I think about schools, how I think of myself, I'd say I was a radical agnostic, right? I'd say scale the best. I don't care if it's a charter, I don't care if it's a district school, I don't care if it's a parochial or another kind of a private school. My view is scale the best and shut down the worst. Be absolutely agnostic in terms of form. Just be brutal in terms of making sure these are places that are closing the achievement gap. There's no other way out for the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of kids, that are living in these places. There's no other way, ultimately, long-term, to create high value. And I'm actually working with a group of people that's putting together a pool of about $100 million right now to fund the scaling up of the best. And there are some great examples in Philadelphia of the best. Uh, I think we're about 10 years away. I think it's happening gradually from what I think of as a kind of a grand bargain with teachers unions. And I think in that grand bargain, what we're gonna, 
what we could come to agreement with is the importance of taking teaching, with, with making teaching into a uh, craft once again, caring about merit uh, once again. I mean, I think if there was, I'm a, nothing against teachers unions, if I had any squabble with teachers unions, it was that they decided to be an industrial union shop rather than a craft union shop. And in deciding to be an industrial union shop where everybody moves forward at the same time rather than a craft union shop where merit counts, at the end of the day, I think what you do is you deprofessionalize yourself and you lose the ability to really um, um, speak toward uh, uh, the right kinds of things. And I used to argue with, an, uh, with a different hat on. I used to argue with uh, building trades labor leaders on things that I did. And I remember all, um, there's some really color. How many people here from Philadelphia? Many, many? There's some really colorful characters in Philadelphia in the building trades world, right? So one of the most colorful ones is John Doherty, affectionately known in Philadelphia as Johnny Doc, right? And I remember talking to him before a negotiation one time of something and for some consulting we were doing and I was arguing about some of the public workers and I said, John, I said, you're on the electrical workers union. I don't like your costs, but I do believe that your guys won't burn my house down when they do the wiring. Because I think at the end of the day, they know what they're doing and you have your own internal process for that. I'm actually not completely sure, but I, I, was, I figured that was a good opening line for Doherty. I said, but you can't tell me that about everybody that's on the line at the Redevelopment Authority in Philadelphia. And he said, well, I can't, you know, he said, well, I, I won't say what he said. But, but they, I just sort of put that aside since I think you taped this, right? But, but I think he, he agreed that there's a difference, shall we say, between a craft union, between the notion of merit in advancement and uh, something else that has a kind of a leveling effect. And I think there's this transformation going on in the way we think about it. And this transformation is related to the fact that increasingly urban districts are shifting to a distributed model, a uh, multi-provider model of management. I mean, at the end of the day, we're gonna look in a district in 10 or 15 years from now, and we're gonna have 20 or 30 really high quality providers, including the district, right? In the 1980s, when people talked about public reform, they would talk about the difference between the public as the rower and the public as the steerer. The public can steer, but it doesn't have to row. It means a different notion of public, right? Somebody, somebody else runs it, it's simply a different notion of what it means to be public. So I would use the example of a school that I know really well, Mastery, which is a school that I helped found and uh, runs a bunch of schools in Philadelphia, uh, some near here. And what I love about Mastery is that most of its schools are turnaround schools. And what I mean by that is that these are schools, uh, I finance the rehabilitation of those schools, but these are schools that um, where people didn't choose to go, all we did is swap out the adults, uh, but we kept the same kids, right? So same kids. So I remember the first one that we did was in Shoemaker, not far from here. It was the second most violent school in Philadelphia based on incidents. It had a remarkably low level of achievement. And you can see here what, it, what the achievement looks like. That's the red pre-mastery pre charter. And then you can see the movement and this line over here is Philadelphia average, and excuse me, the green line is Pennsylvania state average. And in two, three, four years, we're able to, in many instances, close the achievement gap. So it's possible. Same kids, inner city kids, largely African American, absolutely doable. Schools like Shoemaker are, and I can go on and on and on about how and why and why it works. Schools like Shoemaker, I remember the first year when we did it, 50% of their kids, 50% of the kids had either grandparents or foster parents that were their uh, chief guardians, right? So the, so the first thing is we now know it's doable, and the question is why not do it? That's number one. And the second thing is what does it mean to be proficient? Right? That's sort of a big issue, right? So we, we're sort of really happy that kids are proficient, right? I, my kid goes, my kids, I'm in a school district where if you're just proficient, you go to family therapy, right? So here we're fighting like hell to get a couple kids to be proficient. The question is, what does it mean to be proficient versus what does it mean to be competitive? Particularly in an economy that's so rapidly changing, not only regionally and nationally, but, but globally. But the first point here is, it's absolutely possible to change the core basic. And what you do is you find what in fact works and you build and scale around what works. 
and everything else you shut down. All right? That's a tough agreement to have. I think we're going to come to the point, based on what I've seen, where that agreement is going to become increasingly a necessity. This is uh, one of the schools, and in fact, President Obama, another former community organizer, but he went to law school, so I guess he became president. So, who he, he talked about mastery picket uh, at uh, a speech that he gave because you can see the transformation in just a couple years. We didn't actually have their scores when we came in. It was total chaos, just total chaos. There were no records. There were no documents. This is a school just not too far from here, right? It's absolutely doable, but I could walk into any school in Philadelphia or Chicago, in New York or in Baltimore, and tell you in 10 minutes whether the adults or the kids were on the school. And I'm slow. You could probably do it in five minutes. You're smarter than me, right? The, the question is, how do you create high-quality, achievement-oriented, normative institutions, right, whose values are going to move kids in the right direction? How do you quantify it, and how do you reproduce it, and how do you scale it, right? and based on your view of what a great school is. And my sense is there's maybe 20 great schools in Philadelphia at the most. And if you want to tip the system, you better come up with 100 great schools. Anybody that tries to change the system based on the system, I wouldn't, you know, I'm an investor. And as an investor, I believe in the integrity of transactions. I believe in the integrity of deals. And so, excuse my language, but to some extent, a school in that sense is a deal. And I want to make the deal work and then I want to learn from that deal, and I want to figure out how to make another five, another 10, another 15 work, and through the quality of those transactions, I want to see the system itself change, right? Think of the system as a market in that sense. I want to see it change. And you know, I, I have to tell you, I mean, the people that were, the people, many of the people that were involved with us in those schools are people that, that's how they see things. And in fact, they were really uh, terrific about trying to keep us smart. You know, I mean, is anybody here a teacher? And I've been a teacher, but, but so I could criticize myself. But I mean, one of the extraordinary things that I found out about this when I looked is that, and maybe this is true in universities too, is that of all of the institutions in, a, in, in, modern, in the modern world, one of the least, one of the institutions that doesn't do anything around evaluation of employees, do anything very good, is teaching. You walk in and you sit in a classroom, you, and that doesn't help the teacher, right? People don't use data. They don't use high-quality metrics. They don't, it's, you know, there's this view. I once got into an argument with somebody from, a, from a, who I like a great deal from the teacher's union. He said, but you can't do it that way. It's an art. Well, really? Well, what the hell is an art? I don't know any arts people who haven't spent a long time in the craft of their art, right? You, you, think, you think, like, Great painters just walked in one day with a, with a brush. I mean, they mentored, right? They were apprentices. They, they, they were in a there's, a, there's a craft to it. There's a discipline to it, right? You can go from there, but we've lost the notion of the craft of these things. And in that sense, we've lost the notion of the craft of the very institutions that are key to and central to the development of the country and key to poverty reduction and key to creating value in the kinds of places we say we want to create value. And what will that mean? I mean, look at, just sort of think about cities, right? Think about what it means. Look at the, look at these numbers. If you're in Seattle, 55% of the population has a bachelor's degree or more. If you're in Detroit, it's 12%. If you're in Philadelphia, it's 22%. There's been gradual improvement, you know, but the improvement isn't all that rapid. Now, again, I may have the data wrong, but I mean, even throughout this extraordinary de recession that we've been in, I don't remember when the unemployment rate for people with a bachelor's degree or greater was significantly over 5%, if I, my memory is, if there's an economist here. So as bad as the unemployment rate has been uh, for people with bachelor's degrees or more, they may not have had the jobs they wanted to have, they may not have all been full-time, you know, but they weren't as bad. The problem here is if you've got large populations of people in the U.S., which does not have, for the most part, any competitive advantage to do routine labor in a competitive way. If you can't move those people to higher quality education, then you got a problem. 
So that's education, that's the basics. Then there's the question of how do you look at, look at places just in general? You know, how do you look at the whole and how does TRF and others look at this? This is a, a cluster analysis of, of Baltimore. Anybody here from Baltimore? We have any Baltimoreans here? Uh, we do a lot of work in Baltimore. In fact, we work in, uh, anybody here a fan of the wire? We work in one of the wire neighborhoods, right? I mean, the wire was shot in two different neighborhoods. The public housing projects are in West Baltimore. The, the best shots in the wire of the, of the abandoned row homes are in East Baltimore in a community called Oliver. That's where I own a lot of real estate. Okay? If you want to buy some, let me know. Um, the, 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 when we came, come into a place like Baltimore, and we come into a place like Philadelphia, we're trying to get our hands on what's the nature of this place. What is the nature of it? Can we measure it in some way? And here, through good work at our team, is a kind of an analysis of all the different neighborhoods in Baltimore. And we do that similarly in places like Pittsburgh, or we do it similarly in places like Philadelphia. And the idea, I'll go back to the Philadelphia one in a second, the idea is that you've got limited public resources. You're trying to get private resources into these places. The places are quite problematic in many areas. Everybody's got need. Where would you start and why? Why would you choose strategically to use public resources in one way versus another? And how would you measure it over the long term if you were going to do it? And in the absence of good information, you don't know. In fact, in the absence of good information, as we used to joke in Philadelphia, your strategy is a compilation of telephone calls from developers and civic groups and politicians, as opposed to saying, Here's what the data tells us, and then, of course, you can sort of zero down in any of these places and bring in other information and, and form some public products around them and decide you want to invest here or invest there or this is the right way to invest in this place versus another place. So look at Philadelphia. Every dot there is a dot related to a mortgage foreclosure in, from July 2009 to 2010. The poorest places in Philadelphia are around the core around here and over here. And yet, one of the things you found out if you looked at Philadelphia and you looked at mortgage foreclosures, is you found out the, the area right after the poorest places were the areas where mortgage foreclosure densities were the greatest. That's where mortgage foreclosures took off, much more than in the poorest places. Those places are not wealthy in any way. They're actually quite, quite modest. Why would you think that happened? And I sort of get, why, why do you think it wouldn't be the poorest places where there were foreclosures, but it might be the next rung up? Anybody have a hunch? What's that? No, they got mortgages, all right. They may not have been great mortgages to get, but they got mortgages. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. So, so what you had are people on the edge, right? And, why would, and people were trying to get out to get to the next place in most instances because they wanted what anybody wants, better schools, better public safety, access to amenities, and maybe there were a couple people in the family working, but they were stretching, right? They were stretching to those, the next place. And when the economy became a problem, those stretches didn't work out so well, right? And in fact, there are places that had a little bit of equity. If you were going to try to strip equity, if you, you know, had a really cynical view of the kind of lending that went on, which I did, um, then you would say that there are the places where you, there was still equity to be, to be uh, taken out of those units, right? So if you were a, a city and you looked at that kind of data, you would say to yourself, what? If you wanted to, what places would you try to, what kind of in interventions would you do and why would you do them in one place versus another? Anybody? What's clear, yeah. Absolutely. But those places over there with the, with the dots, they're the places that were formerly the sort of stable kind of row home working class neighborhoods, all different racial groups, black, white, Latino, uh, Asian, whatever you think. They're the places that, they're, they're the tax, you know, they, they're the places that are not bottomed out, right? If they go, then what? What if they go? Just think about it. Shut out the lights, right? I mean, if they go, then the tax base gets worse and worse, right? So one question might be, do you, do you work in those kinds of areas 
to preserve those kinds of areas that maybe are most. Those areas, by the way, are the places with, which also, along with new people coming in, where there, sometimes there was ethnic or racial change, there were also places with extraordinarily high levels of elderly populations. So the, the point here is when you're going to think about investing in a place and why you would lend it in a place and you would want to have a market outcome and a public purpose outcome, you would use data, you would use information to sort of get a handle on what's going on and then ask yourself some questions about that and then form public products if you've got access to public money to do it and or form private products as a way to make changes in those places. Make sense? Because look, at the end of the day, in a city like Philadelphia, you're dealing with what? Five, six hundred thousand parcels of real estate. And a mayor comes in and they have a limited amount of money, or think about in Baltimore, and they've got people asking them, they've got lots of problems and lots, everybody wants help, and they've got lots of demands on them, and they've got all kinds of issues, and somebody's got to have a way to look at the information. The same way a business looks at information. The same way you look at information when you make a decision on a stock or a bond. The same way you look at information when you say, why would I invest in this mutual fund or invest in this? Somebody's got to have a way to look at a place, particularly a radically distressed place, use information, say what kinds of choices are people making, investors making, and consumers making? And if I wanted in some way to preserve that place, or if I wanted to find or identify an inflection point to move that place in some way, what would I do? What's my hunch? What's my strategy? Right? In this sense, the only way to pursue the kind of work that I do, and to do it in any way that makes sense, is to use data and information along with capital investment side by side. That's what the difference is between doing it simply because you want the social good, which is very important, and doing it in a way that has got kind of the discipline of maybe the way you would think about it in the marketplace. Make sense? Okay. I do a little bit of everything. So I, I sometimes we do, we're a huge acquisition and construction lender um, for both uh, multifamily and single family. We're, we're, we will analyze, and when, when projects come to us, we'll analyze that place carefully, along with the underwriting of the project, and say what's likely to happen there, what makes sense. As a developer, because we have a real estate development company that we just got to you know, a wall between it, we don't lend to it, but we raise pools of money for it. As a developer, the question is, why in a distressed place would you start in one place and how would you sequence your development and your investments? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, sure. Yeah, most of our investments are like, think of them as bonds, they're debt investments. And so we're making, a we're paying a fixed rate of return. Which used to not look good, but over the last couple of years looks really good. Yeah, uh, so charters are public schools. Uh, they're public charter schools, and they're paying, and they pay back based on, you know, the, the, uh, they've got a budget like anybody else, and um, some districts are good in terms of uh, the per pupil allotment. It's just money following the kid, but it's the same public allotment. Some districts are not as good. Washington's better than Philly, for example. I can say um, in a quarter of a billion dollars of charter school lending, I'm not sure we've missed a payment. Uh, we've had one that went was close to that, and it was in Delaware, and we just worked with the district and brought in another provider. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. We would do what we'd have to do to protect our interest. So think of us as a bank that has a balance sheet like a bank, which isn't regulated uh, the way a bank would be regulated, uh, but is regulated by de facto by its largest investors, right? and regulated by its largest investors because the investor will ask you for certain kinds of, you know, covenants, right, on your investment. So they'll ask us about our capital asset ratio or they'll want reserves to be structured in a particular way. Make, make sense? But yet, alongside this bank, the social bank, right, if you will, which has got a very healthy balance sheet, in fact, has done very well even during this difficult period, or had some issues, um, there's also this little kind of think tank which does data and analytics for other public and private investors, and at the same time does data and analytics for TRF itself as it moves into places. 
and in that sense actually helps sometimes civic groups and others. Look in Baltimore, I remember, um, you know, the first time we went to Baltimore, to Oliver, we went that, to that neighborhood because six years ago now, I guess it's six years ago now, a woman named Mrs. Dawson and her six children were burned out, uh, burned to death in a uh, fire that was set by a drug dealer. I hit national news, it was just terrible because it was the six kids. And the ministers there asked us if we, a group of ministers asked us and some others asked us if we would, and some community organizers asked us if we would come down. And we spent a whole summer down there and we analyzed the place and we walked around with a couple hundred neighborhood volunteers with our laptops trying to figure out what you would do. And they wanted to develop a plan on how to rebuild this place and some other issues related to schools. Our principal question was why would you start? And what, is it possible? What does the data say? Or is it too far gone? And therefore you, would only, you wouldn't pursue place-based investments but you would pursue people-based investments. So there was no possibility for place. Or was it, was it possible, and if it was possible, why? And where would you start, and how would you do it? And it had enough proximity in this case to the Hopkins Medical School that, and some other assets going forth that we thought it was possible, and we've been there ever since. And we did, I mean, if you think about the University of Pennsylvania and its development, we, I wish I had that balance sheet, but if you think about the University of Pennsylvania, it, what it did when it decided to become active in the real estate market is it often took roles in this place that were not purely market roles because it wanted to get rid of a particular building or it, wanted, it would overpay for something because it wanted to get a block in a particular direction or get a hold of some kind of real estate, right? So in that sense, the University of Pennsylvania was the kind of long-term guarantor of that value in that place. Our role becomes, along in this case with these church groups and civic groups, we raised a bunch of money, was to do the same thing, except we would sometimes buy a building that was a place where you know, drug, drug dealing went on and, you know, uh, it was a bad liquor store, and we would buy that and get rid of that, right? I irrational move in terms of short-term economic benefit, rational move in terms of long-term value of the place, and the question is, who's got the balance sheet in those places to be able to incur the cost of that temporary irrationality, if you will? You see what I'm saying? Make sense? Sure. Oh, we do. Yeah, so um, I'm profitable but not profit maximizing, and I would make the distinction between profitable and profit maximizing, and I'm able to have patience that I think you need to have in order to do these kinds of things. So there's where I would say that the difference is. Now, you could argue or you could say, is there a need for institutions and what kind of institutions in development in low-income places or in other situations, is there a need for institutions that are profitable, i.e. sustainable, but not profit maximizing? I would argue that in some point we created GSEs at one time in America for that reason. Maybe they went a little off the wrong way, but we, we did it for that reason. Yeah? If I was going to invest $1,000 in the fund, um, your brochure says, don't expect market competitive returns, but expect returns. If I was in a high income bracket, would I be better off deducting the whole thing as a contribution or holding on and booking it as an investment? Um, better off in what way? In terms of your soul or in terms of your balance? Your, your... No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm big on soul have, here. Once right. you have a, no. Now, so you soul, would, so. Soul and finance for. No, nah, you would be better off. So, so from a finance perspective, you would be better off booking it as an investment and getting the two, three, four percent return. And no different than you would if you have it in a savings checking account or a, you had it in a CD. We're paying better than a CD rate in that sense, right? So it depends, right? Your soul, you would definitely be better just to give me the money and let me. So, let me so I would have an option. You always would have an option. I'm always willing to try to save your soul. Similarly, you know, we, a few years ago, a, a state representative, um, came to me and said, you know, sort of really everybody's talking about this supermarket mess everywhere, and they were really trying to figure out how to do supermarkets in the inner city, and this is at a time when, when the state was in better shape than obviously it is now. He said, what do you think about that? And we spent a whole bunch of time with supermarket operators, and we asked them what the issues were, and they said there were some barriers to entry, and the barriers to entry had to do with everything from not labor costs, but labor readiness and training costs to land assembly, 
sometimes the capital costs, capital investments related to public safety, to a variety of things. And they said, in, in general, here's what it is, and I can incur that cost. And there are also some longer term uh, fixed costs um, that were longer term uh, expensive related to insurance and some other things. And so I said to the state, um, as it was apt to do at that time, give me $30 million and we'll do a demonstration project. project and I'll raise three times the amount. Of course, I didn't know that I could do that. And I'll raise $90 million. And uh, we will uh, help with those barriers to entry. And at the same time, we'll then do the lending or the investment for those supermarket operators. And we will do it in places where we do not think, based on data, that there, where we think there is retail viability, but we do not think that there are high quality, competitively priced food available particularly produce available. And one of the things that uh, Ira Goldstein and his group have done is build this sort of great database. This is Los Angeles, and those blue spots will show you places where we think there's the intersection of retail viability and social need. And at the end of the day, sort of everything we do has got to have that intersection in it. Retail viability and social need. Where do those two things come together? If you're in our business, it has to come together in that way. It can't simply be one or the other. That's the sweet spot for us. And having done that, we've now financed over 80 supermarkets. Um, there's the fresh grocer on North Broad Street, not your fresh grocer here, but the fresh grocer on North Broad Street in Progress Plaza. It's the one that Michelle Obama, uh, First Lady Obama, Michelle Obama visited along with Tim Geithner. I got to go grocery shopping with Tim Geithner and Michelle Obama. It was much more exciting to be with Michelle Obama than Tim Geithner. Um, Tim Geithner didn't quite seem to know which vegetables were which. And, and, um, and we sort of walked around, and, and we've now done over 80 of these. And uh, the portfolio is a really terrific portfolio. But like that mastery charter school, that turnaround school, what is it? It's a middle class amenity in a place where low that low income people use that in fact functions like any other high quality grocery store in terms of its pricing and the quality of its produce. That's it. And there were some bar Yeah, so I got, so I get high, that's right. And what was interesting about this, and, and you know, my portfolio of grocery stores is really in good shape right now, but um, that's an industry that is, you know, rapidly changes. But uh, they were actually in a situation where the only under-retail places were the inner city. And if you could get some of the barriers to entry, and if you could get high-quality managers, again, management was everything, who could do this, and in some instances, who could go out in the neighborhood and figure out what all the different ethnic groups uh, wanted and were eating, and try to figure out the appropriate supply chain. Jeff Brown, who's got a place, uh, shop right at 51st and Parkside, I have within my portfolio five of Jeff's stores. I hope I don't say something I'm not supposed to say. And seven of his stores I don't have. Half of them are suburban, half of them are urban. The highest grossing one is the one at 51st and Parkside. Because he's got no competition. <laughs> he's the best thing going there, right? These are not places where the 120,000 square foot Walmart can enter. Both spatial, some other kinds of issues. Although it is now becoming competitive enough that those places are coming, but are, are, are starting to go. Walmart just introduced a 20,000 square foot store in Chicago. The point I'm trying to get, and I don't want to run over time, but the point I'm trying to make is that there is a market out there for high quality goods that works in terms of both the social issues that we care about and the entrepreneurial issues that make them sustainable. It's absolutely doable. And that what you have to do is figure out sometimes what do you need to do to do the early stage subsidy uh, of organizing that market? How do you organize that market, right? This was not a familiar market to people. American retail was created, i.e. recreated after World War II in the suburbs, right? How do you do it here? Now, if the neighborhood has enough wealth, has enough income, it doesn't matter. They'll figure out how to do it. If it doesn't, you've got a different set of issues. And how am I doing on time? Because I don't want to go. Am I okay? What's that? Getting close. I'm getting close. So I'd say similar for, uh, similarly, and I'll just sort of talk about this and then end up. I'd say similar for, similarly for this vast amount of industrial infrastructure that we have that is being repurposed right now. Also a market for it, but a very different kind of market. This is the Crane Arts Building. 
Has anybody ever been to Crane up in North Philadelphia? Yeah, cool, right? So uh, every building I've shown you here is something that I've financed, so I'm, I'm on the hook for in some way, right? So this is Crane, was a plumbing supply place, 120,000 square feet in it. It's no longer an industrial place, but it's got dozens of artists, craft people, designers, architects. There are dozens of buildings all up and down the riverfront area in North Philadelphia that are being reclaimed for what I think of as the kind of new craft and new industrial possibilities. And they are not simply arts in the sense that you may think of, I mean, arts are great, you know, arts buildings uh, with uh, artists or painters or sculptors. They are people who've, who produce a variety of different kinds of products. There's a really extraordinary story going on, and it's, being, it's going on quietly. Uh, there's demand for it. There's not demand for this to be industrial in the way that it was before, but there are terrific possibilities there, and the city has got competitive value for that because of its proximity to the downtown, because of the usefulness, of, because of the, the nature of the space, and because of the value of the space, right? So there's this, and in fact, you go up and down the riverfront wards in Philadelphia, and many of these buildings look like they're dead and nobody's in there. That's because they've only rehabbed the insides of them. They can't afford yet to rehab the outside, but in fact, inside, they're alive, and they're on fire, and there are terrific things happening. So part of what you do if you're in my business is you discover what's out there. You discover where the burning bush is. And you say, what's, what, what are entrepreneurs doing that are repurposing these kinds of places? And how can I use my capital to elevate it in some way and to move it forward? So I'll just uh, skip here. OK, so now let me get back to this last point, and then we'll just take some questions. I mean, it struck me in these 20, 25 years that I've been doing this um, that um, one of the things I've learned is that neither government or markets, particularly to solve these problems, are very good at being solo flyers. That uh, markets themselves, in and of themselves, can't easily reinvent these places for a variety of reasons. And that government has significant limits in terms of what it can do. And sometimes when I put on TV, I feel like I'm sort of caught in a world where one side, you know, the, there's one narrative, it's a very simple narrative about just get down regulation, just get entrepreneurial zeal going, lower taxes, and the world itself will change and markets will self-correct. Maybe sometimes in some context that works in the world that I'm in for the most part. In fact, it needs some government relationship to it. It needs some public money. It needs the right kind of regulation. It needs the right kind of public force. On the other side of the equation are the Democrats, who, for whom government sometimes answers too many questions, and for whom crowding out the marketplace. You know, I, I, I remember when the, when the stimulus came, I said to somebody on my board, who's actually a well-known economist, I won't mention his name, I said, the good news is the Democrats are in and they understand that there's a role for government, and the bad news is they actually think it works, right? Because I've been in that world trying to make it work, and it does work, some of it, but it's got its limits. All of the people that I know that have been successful trying to repurpose buildings, rebuild neighborhoods, redo schools, bring in the best kind of entrepreneurial talent into places, have understood how to work in the intersection of public purpose and private sector initiative and discipline. They've understood in a very pragmatic way that uh, they've got to figure out how to get to simple on the other side of the complex. But yet, our politics is ruled by this pretty simplistic uh, narrative. And it's that simplistic narrative, and I hear it every time I'm going to go home, and I'll, I'll flip on the TV, and I'll go back and forth between Fox and MSNBC, and I'll, I'll get actually a little ill on both of them as I go on. Because nobody that actually tries to get anything done actually thinks in those ways. And my sense is, at least about Americans, that they're actually pretty damn pragmatic. And what they want, and they're not very ideological. And from my perspective, that's usually pretty good. And what they would actually like is they'd like effectiveness. But the pragmatic center, the people who sort of are effective in this kind of work, have very, very limited policy or political voice. In fact, it really doesn't go from there up. They don't abstract from there. And the kind of social entrepreneurs, the sort of social enterprise that myself and others have been involved in, offers, I think, some kind of low scale, I mean, you know, 50, 60 stores here and there, uh, glimpses into alternatives that can use market rationality to pursue public good, but understand that they've got to look for in these kinds of places a balance 
between the power of markets and the limits of markets and what it means in terms of capturing public good. And as I said before, I thought, you know, race to the top. I think some of what's going on in schools is a way to that. But I think ultimately it's going to require a view of the kind of substantive interpenetration of the marketplace and the government, what really, how things really work. Um, and I think that has not been adequately articulated. And I think for you, I'll speak to the people in the audience who are a lot younger than me, I think the challenge in front of us, if we want to get to the other side of complexity, we want to get to simplicity on the other side of complexity, is to articulate a vision in our practice and in the kind of policy narrative that we develop, that you develop in your life, that doesn't fall, fall um, uh, doesn't have the pitfalls of being either a, you know, kind of a market ideologue on the one hand, right? Um, I mean, who could forget when Alan Greenspan woke up one day and said, gee, I, all markets aren't, you know, turned out I was wrong, right? Guy who thought Ayn Rand was the high point of social theory. And on the other hand, who can forget the extraordinary amount of experiments we've seen over the 20th century where government and public solutions have been quite problematic and have left us with a high level, with really, really low productivity and with no advancement. So there is a center here, and I would urge you in your work, whether you're going to the public sector and the private sector, where you are right now, is to search for that pragmatic center and to figure out the best ways with your colleagues to articulate it and to try in that way to reinvigorate American policy and politics. And I'll stop right there. Thank you.